so, you know, I've spent as you, you know, 25, seven years plus yeah. plus in the trenches, bringing it back to where it was, but through that lens of design, right. Saying it's about no compromise. It's about yes. And yes, style, quality, fit, color, comfort, hand price, and ethically made fair trade, organic or regenerative or circular or some, you know, sustainable fibers and materials, low impact dyes, you know, and all biodegradable and all the things that make the and and make it look good, feel good and do good in the world. Welcome to Business with Purpose. I'm your host, Molly Stillman of Still Being Molly. And this show is all about bringing you the stories behind the brands, the companies and the small businesses that are changing the world. Each week, I get to sit down with an incredible entrepreneur, CEO, nonprofit director, community leader, author, activist, or just an awesome person who is trying to make a positive impact, not only through their personal life, but also with their career. My goal is to show you, the listener, that no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, you can make an impact in the world. My guest this week is Marcy Zaroff. She is the one who coined the term eco-fashion back in 1995. She's an internationally recognized eco-lifestyle expert, educator, innovator, serial entrepreneur. She is the author of Eco Renaissance, co-creating a stylish, sexy, and sustainable world. She is also the founder and CEO of Eco Fashion Corp, which is a greenhouse of brands, including B2B turnkey sustainable fashion manufacturer MetaWare, regenerative organic cotton farm project Reset, QVC affordable sustainable lifestyle brands Farm to Home and Seed to Style, and a new direct to consumer organic fashion brand called Yes And. She's also the founder of Under the Canopy, the producer of the thread documentary Driving Fashion Forward, the co-founder of Good Catch, Beyond Brands, and the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. She has been instrumental in driving authenticity, environmental leadership, and social justice worldwide for over three decades. She is a powerhouse. It was such an honor to have Marcy on the show. I was just blown away by our conversation. She is a wealth of knowledge and information and just somebody who you want to learn more from, sit down and just soak up all of the information because she is a bad mama jamma, if you know what I'm saying. I loved her. So you're going to love this conversation. But before I get to my conversation with Marcy, I want to thank our partner of the show who is able to help make this show happen. And that's Mama Suds. Are you looking to clean up your household cleaning products this year? Mama Suds is here to help. The best way is simply start with one product. Every time you run out of a specific cleaning product, just replace it with a non-toxic one. Or another tip is to just purchase a product that has multiple uses. The Mama Suds collection has incredible multi-use products such as their Castile soap, which is one of my favorites, the toilet bombs, and the multi-purpose household cleaner are amazing. Also, the Mama Suds blog has a ton of great tips and a Castile soap recipe that you can print and make your own effective cleaners with. So give them a try at mamasuds.com. M-A-M-A-S-U-D-S.com. Don't forget to use the coupon code MOLLY for 15% off your order. Now, without further ado, on to my conversation with Marcy. Marcy, I'm so excited to have you. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. Happy Monday, Molly. <laughs> I'm so pumped to uh, get to know you because you have you are somebody who has been in this space uh, in the the ethical, you know, conscious consumer, whatever buzzword we want to say, uh, <laughs> space for a long time, and and really before it was something even people knew and understood and 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 realized um a couple years ago cuz i mean you you're the one who kind of we're going to talk about this but sort of coined the term eco fashion um back in 1995 and um i remember a couple of years ago i was um the keynote speaker at the fair trade federation conference in austin and uh it was the 25th anniversary conference 
And we talked about the fact that when the Fair Trade Federation started in 1994, there were like 12 members. And now like yeah. at that conference alone, there were, you know, over 200. And so to just think about how far things have come. And anyway, so I'm so excited to just to talk to somebody <laughs> who's been in this for so long. Um, so without further ado, uh, let's uh, <laughs> give us the Marcy 101. So tell us who you are, what you do, how you got to where you are today. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, be careful what you wish for, right? No, it's all good. <laughs> so, you know, you talk about back in the 90s, right? When you had like, there was a small little group. So when I started my, can you call it, you know, my path to conscious products, lifestyle, this whole kind of journey I've been on, you know, the journey of a thousand miles, yeah. right? But, you know, back in the day, everyone in the organic movement globally <laughs> knew each other. Yes, That's how totally. small it was, right? So like, you know, I go back and in 1990, I co-founded a school that is known today as the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, IIN. So, you know, I think there's uh, somewhere around 170 or 80,000 graduates that are health coaches. So kind of once I, I unpack the fact that, you know, we don't just say you are what you eat, but actually when you start to understand how food is energy and as Maslow's hierarchy of needs is our first basic need. So as I started to really integrate kind of the power and the relationship we have with food from a standpoint of, you know, kind of what the Rodale Institute says, right? Healthy soil uh, makes healthy plants, makes healthy people. And as I started to understand the relationship of agriculture and products as it, you know, related to our sense of health and well-being, I sort of evolved and I partnered with the founder of Aveda who became one of my best friends through the years. He was my mentor of 25 years. And we opened the first Aveda Concept Salon together. So connecting food to beauty. Mm -hmm. And then I had this kind of aha um, because I was doing a lot of consulting and I had some really interesting sort of, you know, moments through that process that made me realize, wait a minute, what about fashion and fiber and textiles? Mm. So in 1995, I coined and trademarked the term eco fashion. People thought I was crazy. Who will ever buy into that? People who are into fashion don't care about the environment and people who are into social justice and you know ecology are not the people into fashion. And I was like, well, hmm, I'm that person and I can't be alone. So I started the first sustainable fashion and home brand in North America called Under the Canopy with this whole premise that we live yeah. under the canopy of the planet's ecosystem together. And then fast forward, you know, over the last 25 years, um, I've been writing standards. I've been doing public speaking. I wrote a book called Eco Renaissance, co-creating a stylish, sexy and sustainable world, produced a documentary film series called Driving Fashion Forward with Amber Valletta. And today I'm the founder and CEO of Eco Fashion Corp which is a greenhouse of brands made up of metaware, farm to home, seed to style, yes, and, which is really my life philosophy, and Reset, which is our regenerative organic cotton farm project in India. And there's more, but that's kind of like, you know, kind of the last 30 years in a cliff note version. Oh, I love it. I love it so much. There's so much I'm, I, I'm excited to unpack. Um, so I, I want to go back a little bit because one of the things I think is really interesting about your journey in particular is how yours started with food, kind of evolved to beauty and then went to fashion. And this is something it just like I feel and my listeners already are like, I know exactly where Molly's going with this because she talks about this all the time, <laughs> because this is something that I've talked about since I launched this podcast. I talked about it on my blog prior to that. So, you know, 10 plus years. And I talked about how we really saw late 90s, but I would say early 2000s is when we really began to see uh, that, you know, the the farm to table movement, we started learning more about GMOs and our food and, and people, you know, there was this, I would say just huge uh, kind of push for organic food and all that kind of stuff. And that was sort of like that beginning. And now, you know, it's so common. I mean, every place has organic brands now and and going to farmers markets. I mean, I live on a farm myself and that's one of our our, our big passions is is growing and, and, and living more sustainably and um, only eating the food, eventually getting to the point where we're only eating the food um, that we either raise or grow ourselves and knowing kind of shortening that food supply chain. So that's something that's obviously uh, sort of a gateway. And then I I saw this trend where it was like, okay, so that became like a big a big thing. And then, and I don't have exact dates in mind, but I just I I just kind of I'm a noticer, and we're gonna get to that too. But then the <laughs> second path was sort of the clean beauty path, and then it was like all of a sudden everybody's talking about what's in your beauty products and what's in your skin products and parabens and sulfates and and 
all these sort of artificial ingredients. And now, I mean, I'm when I first started using clean beauty brands, there was like three. And now there's so many clean beauty brands. And then, of course, you get into greenwashing. That's a whole nother thing. Um, mm -hmm. And I said, but I think and I really think and it's been huge over the last few years, but I think we're going to see it even more in the next five to 10 years is the transition from fast fashion, uh, you know, inorganic or that's not the word I'm looking for, but you know, kind of uh, artificial textiles, all these kinds of things that are just polluting the environment. Obviously, the people that are making our clothes are in horrible conditions and all these kinds of things to brands standing up and saying, no, th this has to change. And consumers then sort of following. And um, I mean, we've seen that with, you know, Madewell coming out with a fair trade denim line and Target coming out with a fair trade denim line and, and partnering with uh, International Justice Mission to eliminate, uh, you know, human trafficking in their supply chains, all these kinds of things. And so I think it's so interesting that that was your path. And um, I would love for you to kind of dig deeper a little bit into that as to how that that that, that transitioned for you. And what was it just like, oh, you were paying attention to your food. And then it was like, oh, well, beauty was sort of the next logical step. And then it was sort of fashion. Like, <laughs> what was that journey like for you? Yeah. So, well, I, I would say this, you know, food is, as we spoke to about kind of Maslow's hierarchy of needs yeah. and that first place that people think about, it's the entry point, right? It's the gateway. Yeah. And then, you know, it once you plant the seed of consciousness, there's that inevitable, as you discovered yourself, what's next? What else? What more? Well, when I started my journey, so when I was 16 years old, a girlfriend of mine gave me a book called Living in the Light by mm. Shakti Gawain. And that had this like, wow moment for me of like, there's more than what we see. And Horace, the founder of Aveda, who I said was my mentor of 25 years, yeah. always taught me that, you know, if you can appeal to people at a visceral level, which he did so brilliantly with Aveda, right? Then you kind of, you Act, they, they get sort of engaged from a place of like, intuition, but don't even know it. Mm. And once there's the questions of like, oh, plant-based wisdom, ancient, you know, indigenous cultures, you know, healing traditions, like all the things Aveda was really about, then you could take them down that proverbial, you know, rabbit hole of the why and the what and the how and the where. But first and foremost, you know, appeal to people aesthetically. And that's the yes. So that mm -hmm. means in food, it has to taste good. In beauty, it has to smell good and work. Yes. In fashion, it has to look good and be, you know, quality and, and price value mm -hmm. equation. And so if you, and in business, you have to make money, right? So that's the classic kind of the yes of business. Like if you're not sustainable financially, you're not going to be able to stay in business. So if you lead with the yes, which is kind of what, when I had that sort of aha, that it, you can't support one part of the equation without the other because they're all interconnected. So from agriculture to popular culture, right, in lifestyle, the evolution of Maslow from what we put in our bodies, our basic need to what we put on our bodies, our shelter, our clothing, right? It's that natural evolution of another basic need and that realization that once you get that what you put in your body matters, you start to realize, oh, you mean I have a relationship with the energy or the actual ingredients that go into mm -hmm. me? Well, your skin is the largest organ in your body. It's your primary organ for absorption, right? So as you start to then connect, oh, right, what I put on my body matters too, because that's going to get absorbed in my body. So that was kind of one of the health and wellness ahas. Like you can't, you know, like, you got to be thinking about what we put on and that's beauty and that's clothing and that's your bedding at night that you're breathing in through your skin. Right. right. And then on the agriculture side, the, one of the first things I learned in collaborating back in the you know early nineties with the Rodales was that the food and fiber crops, part of the, the methodology of organic agriculture is crop rotation. And when you start rotating crops together, you get cotton and lentils and different yeah. crops rotating together to build soil health, to build the nutrients of the soil. And when I learned that 60% of a cotton plant is going into the food stream, so the seed that gets ginned out when you harvest cotton yeah. goes into feed for dairy. It goes into getting broken down as cotton seed oil that goes into a huge array of, of snack foods and bread products and all kinds of things. When you read the ingredient list, you'll see cotton seed oil 
is very common. And then when I learned that cotton is one of the most heavily sprayed industries in agriculture mm-hmm. and is such a dirty crop, especially because people's misconception is, oh, I'm not eating it. So we can spray the shit out of it, yeah. you know, and, and it's like one of the biggest users of the most toxic and most harmful pesticides and herbicides. And, you know, so when you start to learn about all, you know, these sort of both sides, the source and the story going back to your farm to table. Yeah. I went like, what? How come nobody knows this? Yeah. So having gone from food to beauty, the natural evolution in sort of the wellness equation for me was like fiber and textiles. And the more I sort of peeled the layers of the onion off and went down that rabbit hole, and unveiled the human and environmental impacts of fashion, it only further empowered me to say, you know, it's like Albert Einstein, we can't solve today's problems with the same consciousness that created them. Mm. We have to change our consciousness about the way we see fashion. And in some ways come full circle back to where it started, where it was inspired by nature. And it got so out of control with fast fashion. So, you know, I've spent as you, you know, 25, seven years plus plus in the trenches, bringing it back to where it was, but through that lens of design, right? Saying it's about no compromise. It's about yes and. Yes, style, quality, fit, color, comfort, hand, price, and ethically made, fair trade, organic or regenerative or circular or some, you know, sustainable fibers and materials, low impact dyes, you know, and all biodegradable and all the things that make the and and make it you know, look good, feel good and do good in the world. Oh, that's so cool. Well, real quick, I was going to ask you this later, but since you were just talking about it. So you talked about how one of your philosophies is yes, and 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 you have this uh, brand yes, and I just have to ask the question, have you taken an improv comedy class at any point? (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, it's a great question. And very synchronistically, both of my children are in the performing arts, they both went to musical theater, graduated. And so I am familiar with yes, and from that lens. In yeah. fact, when we launched the Yes And brand, the month, like a week before COVID hit, my daughter and her, some of her friends did and a whole improv thing in sort of in alignment with the Yes And brand um, concept. So, That's so yes. cool. <laughs> well, because uh, as my listeners know, I have a background in comedy and I did uh, improv for uh, over oh, 10 awesome. years. And so, you know, that's been one of my own personal philosophies and so many things and, and just kind of my approach to life is this idea of yes and. And so uh, it's so funny when I first was introduced to the brand, I was like, I have to ask <laughs> the creator of this brand if they're if they know improv at all, because it's just yes, it's this. I, and, I mean, there's so many things. And, and uh, for my listeners, if you have not listened to my episode with uh, Joy Egrich Reed, uh, it was the first episode of 2022. So just right back at the beginning of January, we both talked oh, for 45 minutes on the episode about our love of improv and, and how it a- applies to business. So you should go back and listen to that episode. But I just I love that that's uh, your philosophy as well. And uh, something that I want to kind of touch on and and that idea that you were saying of, you know, yes, it has to be all of these things. And it also has to be all of these things is so important because one of the things that, you know, for the last, I don't know, uh, carry the one, I don't know, 11, 12 years that I've sort of been on this personal journey towards, uh, you know, kind of this eco lifestyle. and, And we'll dive more into that in a little bit is the is, I guess, the frustration that I have where I sometimes I feel like I'm like banging my head against a wall with some uh, b- brands who are in this space who because a lot of times people who don't know this space hear the term eco fashion, fair trade, and they have a very specific mm-hmm. image in their head of like macrame vests in a sunflower field, like singing Kumbaya and like that it's just like not trendy and it's like ugly and it's uh it looks looks handmade you know what i mean like it's i just- call oh yeah i call that the crunchy frumpy boxy beige and boring yes and most com- and most commonly asked question i've gotten especially in the early parts of my career can you smoke it after you wear it yes yes oh my gosh and it just and i'm like no and uh and then when i see you know sometimes it's just like oh it frustrates me so much um because so often those i mean and and, and hear my heart if you own one of those brands, <laughs> I love you so much. Um, but, you know, so often th- those types of things over the years created that that uh, almost cycle of pity purchasing where it's like, oh, or like guilt purchasing. or like, well, I'm going to buy this because it's handmade in Guatemala or whatever. It's or it's handmade in 
some like tiny village over here or, it's, <laughs> or something where it's like, no, 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 no. We are missing the mark. One, uh, that does a disservice to the artisans because the artisans themselves or whoever's making like they don't want a pity purchase. They want you to buy it and wear it because it is beautiful and it is classic and it is well made and it's stylish and all these kinds of things like that's what they want. They don't want you just buying it because they feel like, oh, well, this person, you know, in a Western country feels bad. I have very strong feelings about this, obviously. But, you know, so I, what do you think? Because I've seen such a huge shift, especially in the last few years. Um, when I started my ethical brand directory on my blog back in 2015, there was like 35 brands on there. I mean, I know that there were more, that, but those were the only ones I could find at the time. Now I have over a hundred or over 400. And so, you know, when I see like, over the last six, seven mm -hmm. years, that the change and the quality of these brands and how you have some of these just incredibly stylish. I think of like Veta and uh, the Root Collective and Seiko Designs, and you have some of these just beautiful brands that come out with these stylish, incredible products that you just didn't see that as much earlier on. What do you think, in your experience and your expertise, like has been that that transition? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, first of all, you know, it, I would liken it to, you know, when I started my career and people were making tofu in their bathtubs. Right. And then, <laughs> you know, and then like, you know, if I, I remember conversations with people around, you know, organic food back in the early nineties, and they would look at me cross-eyed like, Oh, you're just brainwashed. That doesn't really do anything, you know? And I spent a lot of my years in the trenches of the organic movement, you know, doing policy work in DC as a member of the board of the organic trade association. And, you know, really, you know, meetings in the White House and Congress and the USDA to kind of keep pushing this movement as good business, right? And so what I've seen is, you know, there's been this sort of both sides of the aisle bipartisan adoption of the of, you know, these movements, because it's about doing well by doing good in the world. Right. And I always say as a, as a, you know, an entrepreneur, I feel like a little kid in a candy store, I get to do what I love, make a living and change the world, mm. right? Like check, 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 five P's people, planet, profit, passion, and purpose. And I think what's changed is that the younger generations have woken up with the internet at their disposal, which yeah. former generations didn't have, which means they can pull the curtain back and they can say, you know, what's in my clothes? Who made my, you know, what's in my food? Who made my clothes and my fabric? Where's it being made? And ask the questions that my generation couldn't ask, right? So the internet was a huge catalyst and it's not even about staying ahead anymore. It's about not being left behind. You know, I used to say in the early part of my career, if people ask me kind of what's your meta vision, right? I would say it's to make the norm the alternative and the alternative the norm. Yes. Because it used to be that organic and healthy food or clean beauty or sustainable fashion were considered these alternative niche movements, right? Yeah. And I think the more it's like the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Right. And what's been an accelerator is that as you connect the lifestyle dots, which is what my book Eco Renaissance is all about. It's that, you know, it starts with art. You talked about design and supporting the little guy. No, art is we're all creators. We've created the reality we see and we live every day. Let's create a new reality. Let's all be at the table and co-create and design differently, design our food system differently, our beauty system differently, our fashion system differently, the way we see business and the way we define good business, right? You've got B Corp or social purpose corps. So it really does come down to, you know, how can we use business as a force for good? Mm -hmm. How can we as consumers vote with our dollars and make sure that we're supporting the brands, the products and the companies that are, you know, doing well by doing good? And so I think as we're seeing this convergence now across sectors, from government to consumers to business, you know, and sort of all tides are rising together. And, and you know, I always say, my favorite number is 11, right? And I got married on 11, 11, 11, actually at horse, the founder of Aveda's birthday in his house. And that number is a very auspicious, very powerful number because to me, it signifies one plus one equals 11. Mm. We're stronger together than we are apart exponentially. So it is much, very much right now about co-creation across industries, across within an industry. And it's no longer about you know, competition, it's about cooperation, right? Mm. So that's what I think is happening is, you know, this sort of awakening that, and what I call the eco-renaissance, the rebirth 
of humanity that's being built on this realization that we're all a part of an ecosystem, not just with each other, but also with nature and the animal kingdoms and right. And you look at this pandemic. And while, of course, I don't make light of the suffering, the gift it's given us is it's created even a further, you know, propellant to for people to think about reset their priorities and say what really matters, right, you know, family, health, wellness, community, you know, purpose, right. And I think those those seeds of what I call the five C's, right, creativity, community, collaboration, connection and consciousness are at the core, they're the DNA of each of these kind of sectors that are transforming, hopefully, as we have this like modern day Star Wars of the light and the dark forces working against each other, yeah. you know, we're hopefully breaking out and turning on that light, which is really what's going to drive us forward with forward progress. Yeah. Oh, man, I love that so much. Um, you know, and I, I come from also a faith perspective um, and and my faith has has really influenced a lot of this. And, and I, you know, I very much take that whole idea of, you know, being a light in the darkness. And what does that look like? And and believing that everything was, you know, created by God to to work in symbiosis together. And, you know, it's so amazing too. like, I was not, uh, you know, my dad was a gardener when I was a kid, but I was certainly like, I would watch him garden and and I was always kind of fascinated by it, but was certainly like, I was the person who like, give me like a fake plant and I'll probably kill it. Um, but now, (laughs) you know, over the last seven, eight years, I have, um, you know, really come to love and, and appreciate gardening. And now that we live on a farm and, you know, my husband and I are, are, you know, doing our spring garden planning right now. We're in the throes of that. And we ordered all of our, you know, our new seeds. And um, we were talking about crop rotation. And we've been doing a lot of studying on soil. And that's one of the things that we just didn't know a lot about when we first started gardening. And it's fascinating when you really start to learn about how plants grow and the composition of the soil and how all of that is like, so, so, so vital for how things grow. And, and you don't want to plant uh, tomatoes in the same spot, you, you know, two years in a row because the soil, the nutrients are depleted. But if you plant potatoes where you planted tomatoes the previous year, like how those nutrients that, I mean, it's just, it's fascinating and I can go on a whole rabbit hole, but I think so much about like what you were saying earlier of how all of those things sort of work together for, um, to influence the decisions that we make as we learn those things and how like you could go into all these different metaphors about our, you know, the soil of our, our hearts and the soil of our minds and the soil of our lives and how all those things that we learn and, and, and help the next thing sort of grow and thrive. I, you know, but I, I want to kind of use that as a transition point to talk more about your book, Eco Renaissance, creating, co-creating a stylish, sexy and sustainable world. Love the title so much. Um, and so, you know, talk to us about this book, where, where the idea for it sort of stemmed from. And also for people who are listening, and maybe this isn't something that they have adopted a lot yet, um, but can feel really overwhelming. What does it look like? to create a lifestyle um, that is, you know, that eco lifestyle, like how, where do they even start if they're feeling like this, this is very overwhelming to me. I don't know where to start. What do I do? Talk to us all about that. Yeah. So, I mean, that is exactly why I wrote the book, right? Is because I don't know where that seed of consciousness will get planted, but because this is a lifestyle, this isn't just, you know, about like, oh, I'm going to eat less red meat, or I'm going to just, you know, buy an organic shirt, or I'm going to, you know, start to use a more clean beauty. This is about understanding kind of the cause and effect of every choice that we make and, and having a deeper sort of get around, you know, it starts one step at a time. Don't go home and like throw everything away. It's about yeah slowly integrating this mindset of, oh, you mean I can be a part of the solution versus the problem just by making different choices. Mm -hmm. So I take people on this journey in eco-renaissance that starts with art because art is the language. It's, you know, as I spoke to, it's about creation and co-creation and, and whether it's, you know, musicians that are using their platforms or artists using their platforms to inspire change through positive messaging. Or my daughter started a nonprofit called Entertainment for Change, Mm. which is all about leveraging the power of all the different entertainment arts, you know, whether it's comedy or, you know, uh, acapella or it's poetry or, you know, conventional theater, music, film, whatever it is, it's infusing that messaging that's going to 
activate and, and inspire people to think differently. So then the next chapter is all about food. And I talk about, you know, everything from regenerative and organic agriculture to plant the plant-based movement and sort of understanding sort of the idea that, you know, you don't have to give up taste, right? That's the yes. But look at all these things you should be thinking about when you're making choices today. Mm -hmm. And then I move into wellness and I talk about, you know, our lifestyle choices, practice, meditation, yoga, the water we drink, like all these other elements just to kind of think about how they serve us, right? Or don't. And then moving into beauty and then into fashion and then into business. So it's the evolution. It's the interconnection of these lifestyle dots that are all being sort of, you know, grounded in, you know, this sort of common DNA, you know, as I spoke to the five C's and you talked about soil. Well, I'm a soil junkie. Like I have always been fascinated because it's a mirror of our own selves, Mm -hmm. the ecosystem in soil. In fact, I would liken the soil as the skin of the earth. Yeah. Right. So, so when you think about the metaphor of building our own immune system and our skin is there to protect us, building soil health and having that soil protect us. It's not just about protecting the plants, right? Because we breathe out carbon and soil and nature breathe in carbon and they breathe out oxygen and we breathe in oxygen. So you talk about the symbiotic relationship. We have to protect soil health because what people don't know is soil is one of our greatest solutions to climate change. Because when it's healthy and biodiverse and the ecosystems are thriving, it's a living, breathing ecosystem that actually sequesters carbon out of the atmosphere. So when I talk about connecting food, beauty, and fashion, I'm also looking at that interconnection in agriculture where we're building the nutrients by crop rotation and all the methodologies of intercropping and And building those ecosystems. So you know, it's how do I take the like, it's like water for chocolate. How do I take that energy, the seed, the seed that, you know, representing life up to consumer products and activate and educate people. So therein lies sort of the premise of my book is meet people where they are. This isn't scary. It's not about (laughs) sacrifice or deprivation. You're not giving things up. This is about getting more, right? More value, more health, more, you know, fulfillment, more empowerment in your life, something that will, I believe, resonate at that sort of lifeline to truth, which is your gut, right? Which is kind of the light, right? Which is turn on the light, which is why I have 40 people in my book I call Illumin Artists who are leveraging their own personal platforms to drive change in the world across those categories, art, food, fashion, business, wellness, and beauty. Yeah. And so it's, you know, Stella McCartney and Susie Cameron and, and, you know, Lauren Bush and like, you know, the beauty counter and like go into brands. So I try to be very practical and, and functional because you got to have fun. We have to make this cool. Yeah. It's sexy. And it's not about making fashion sustainable as much as it is making sustainability fashionable. Ooh, I love that. Oh, I'm so excited to dive into this book because this is obviously something that I am deeply passionate about. I care so, so, so much about it because I really believe that it is a root. It's a, it's a root of change for so many things. And, and I have, I feel like I've said this ad nauseum over the years is, you know, especially when you look at some of the world's greatest problems and the things that uh, we are so often just horrified by. And, you know, I'm, I don't mean to, I'm not making light of any of these things or, or oversimplifying them. And sir, surely I'm making some generalizations. But when you really look at some of the world's deepest issues, like, you know, human, human trafficking, labor trafficking, sex trafficking, um, child marriages, uh, drug trafficking, so often, uh, even g- gang violence. I mean, you can name a million different things that I feel like when you really, uh, to, you know, to s- use the phrase that you used earlier, kind of peeling back those layers of the onion, when you look at the root of a lot of those issues, it's a lack of access to to jobs. It's a lack of access to uh, sustainable employment or, or sustainable economic opportunity. Um, and, you know, just so many different factors that when we invite ourselves into this lifestyle, when we ap- apply some of these things and we provide opportunities that are more sustainable, making sustainability fashionable, you really can be- begin to see the ripple effects of those things and, and, and uh, you know, really uh, creating positive change that is uh, long term. And so this is just something that I, I love the way that you break this down. 
So my next question is one of the, what is your response to the people that say, well, this is too expensive. This is too Mm. hard. Um, This is inaccessible for people who might be at or below the poverty line. There are so many, you know, kind of debates and things that I see over the years that say like, well, this is just still too out of reach for people. How do you respond to that? Yeah, well, you know, that was the same kind of argument on in the early years of, you know, the organic and natural food system. It was like, oh, whole paycheck, right? Like you can't Mm -hmm. buy it if you're not super rich and it's only for the elite. Today, the biggest buyer of organic food in America is Costco, right? So, you know, Walmart, Target, Amazon, I mean, everyone's at the table now. It's not a, you know, it's a supply and demand thing more than it is a, I can't afford it because it's organic thing, right? And the same thing with sustainable fashion. There really have been three stigmas. Stigma one, we talked about, you know, you have to give up style or color, quality or fit, you know, and it's a potato sack and it's beige and, you know, so that's not true. There's nothing we can't create from a design aesthetic. Right. the second stigma that you have to pay a lot more, I can't afford it. You know, how could I be a part of this if it's just out there for only the rich? And that's not true either. It really comes down to building more vertically integrated supply chains that are more efficient, that start up, that we cut out some of those layers that are just excessive, like in a garment, you know, a, an apparel item can change hands seven to 10, maybe even more times in a supply chain. So our model at MetaWare, because I've been doing this for 25 years, is starting at the farm, right? We have our farm called Reset, which stands for Regenerate the Environment, Society, and Economy through Textiles. We start at the farms or the raw materials, whether it's, you know, Tencel Lyocell, which is made derived from eucalyptus. We call it eucalyptus, or it's banana, which we're going to be launching this year. And it's like starting at the farm gate. And staying away, you know, as much as possible from the synthetics, definitely staying away from the virgin synthetics that are just never going to biodegrade and are just, you know, shedding microfibers into our water systems, polluting our oceans ecosystems at Mm -hmm. the same time that all the chemicals are, you know, polluting our lands ecosystems, right? So it's like, it's getting in and just making sure that, you know, everything that we're doing is from the ground up with that full traceability along the way, but cutting out the gin broker, the the cotton brokers, the yarn brokers, all these layers so we can be more efficient. And at the end of the day, we can add value without adding much cost. Mm. But who's getting paid fairly in our in our model is the farmers and the workers, the people sewing and growing the products, right? That historically are the ones who were pushed down the supply chain so much that there was the stigma that you have to pay a lot more. But guess what? You, we weren't paying a lot more to the farmers and the yeah. factory workers. They were the ones who were continuing to get crammed down as the retailers took bigger and bigger margins. Well, what's happening now because of all these new business models, right? Renting, right. resale, you know, re- reuse, um, you know, vintage, the whole circular economy married with the regenerative economy where we're using old materials to create new materials. We're using, you know, biomass and food waste to create materials. We're using organic and regenerative agriculture as a solution to climate change to expand these methods of agriculture that are going to be serving us since a third of the world's cotton, you know, or, or textiles are from cotton. So it's looking through a different lens. And I think that's where we can be more innovative and at the end of the day, more cost effective. And as we build more demand, that price stigma of, well, I have to pay a lot more is already changing. I can tell you at Eco Fashion Corp, we sell on QVC, which is as mass market as you get, yeah. you know, with our brand Seed to Style and Farm to Home. And we're right there price point wise with, you know, conventional goods, but we're meeting that consumer where they are to educate them, you know, about you know, the why and the what. And the same thing with Yes And at joinyesand.com. We really try to lead with being affordable, sustainable, and inclusive every step of the way across our brand. Oh, man. And we have a a resale now too. So that secondhand market is already up and running for Yes And Repeat. Oh, so that's a cheap, uh, lesser way to buy our lesser cost way to buy our products too. Yes, I love that so much, and I'm so glad that you mentioned secondhand because that's always the thing I tell people. I'm like, look, start with that. Shop secondhand. Yeah. Guess what I do with my kids? My kids don't get any new clothes. I like they they think go like a trip to. Uh, my um, kids love thrifting. Yes, they think it's love. so fun. 
they're just like, oh, mom, how much is that? Oh, it's only 99 cents. Yes. Yeah. You know, like they get so excited. So I, and I think that there's not as much of a stigma now with shopping secondhand as there was when I was a kid. And I was forced to shop secondhand when I was like, I remember in the sixth grade, like the only thing I wanted for Christmas was a shirt from Abercrombie and Fitch because I was like, I don't want anything from the thrift store anymore, mom. And like, that was literally like probably the only thing I got. I got a tickle me Elmo and a shirt from Abercrombie and Fitch. Um, so, you know, obviously things have, have changed drastically since then. Oh man, there's so many, I just love all of this, but there's, uh, you know, before we transition to the get to know you realm, I want you to tell us a story, uh, because I, I learned this about you and I just thought what, I mean, this is so cool is, uh, being brought into the Saudi Arabian Royal family, uh, to help, uh, so, and to like help women, uh, with this. So can you tell us this story? Because I'm fascinated oh, by it. Yes. It's actually a funny full circle because recently I, I did a, a public speaking appearance at Saudi Fashion Week, which Fashion Futures, which just launched, which was kind of a really ironic full circle for me. So yeah, going back to, you know, this kind of that aha, connecting the dots of food, beauty, fashion, right? I was kind of in this, you know, mindset back in the early 90s. And I uh, got a call one day from someone who said, you know, hey, my, um, my boss is trying to get pregnant. And somebody told her, you know, she's gone through in vitro multiple times, she told her that if she changes her diet and lifestyle. Maybe that will help. She's desperate. What any she'll do anything. What do we need to do? Can she meet you? Blah, blah, blah. So fast forward. Yes, I started working with her. She ended up getting pregnant. Suddenly I'm working with her cousins and her sisters and others and her family with like, you know, oh, I have my skin breaks out or I'm overweight or I, I need help, you know, with the digestion or so working really from the food place. And that segued into beauty products, right? Of course, they're all women. And it was like, well, what about clean beauty? And, and we had an Abeda spa at our school. So then I would educate them about, you know, how to take care of your skin. And then I would go shopping with them when they would come to America. And one day we were like shopping on Fifth Avenue in New York City. And we were just in like, you know, one of the stores on Fifth Avenue. And it was like, we were ta just talking and they were like, what about fashion? You know, you got us into the food and the beauty. And I'm like, I've been thinking about it from the agricultural lens. And it's like, okay, I'm going to create stuff. Are you going to support it? Yes. And off I went and started to make um, fashion, just work with designers and, and material built materials and got in like literally from the beginning of this movement. And then I traveled to India and really started to build it. And they were always, you know, the Saudi royal family, these women to this day, when they would come to New York, obviously pre-COVID, COVID, you know, has been yeah. kind of a, a, a block for everything. But, you know, I would go, I would be sort of a source for them for all of their health and wellness needs when they come to the city. And it's like, you know, where I live in Manhattan, like, hey, can you get me, you know, wheatgrass juicer? <laughs> can you get me, <laughs> you know, vitamins for this and or, you know, new what's new in sustainable fashion. And so, you know, it's again, this awareness, we opened a wellness center in Riyadh 25 years ago. Um, I sent people over from the US who worked with me at my school to be private chefs, to be private massage therapists, to open this wellness center. So I had a very kind of really interesting relationship going back, you know, almost 30 years ago um, and till this day. Wow, that's so fascinating. And I know that you've also <laughs> worked with uh, Pr Prince Charles as well. You're just like oh, getting invited well. to the royal, royal houses all over the uh, all over the world. You know, I don't think people realize how passionate Prince Charles is about organic um, agriculture. It's one of his absolute biggest passion points. And so back in the early 2000s, I want to say probably around 2002 or three, um, I was invited through my friend Anthony Rodale and, and Gary Hirschberg, the founder of Stonyfield Farms. Gary and I were invited as the two U.S. representatives in a small group, I think 25 people um, from around the world to spend the whole weekend with Prince Charles to talk about connecting the consumer to organic agriculture. So this is 20 years ago, and we put our heads together and we talked about what is it going to take? And we got to tour, go up to his house at Highgrove and tour his organic farms and his organic gardens. And it was just amazing. And one of my favorite moments was we were sitting in the gardens with his, his head gardener, and he was explaining the methodologies going on at these farms at his main house. And over all of a sudden, as we're in a little semicircle listening, all these cows started coming towards us and forming the other half of the circle. And they were all, I don't know if you've ever seen how social cows are, but they really they all were like listening as if they were also fascinated <laughs> by the story. So we formed like this full circle with like half people, half cows. And it was like really kind of eye opening and a reminder that, you know, we all are in this together. You know, we all are 
part of an ecosystem together and and even by category you know as i said from food to beauty to fashion and fiber you know agriculture is there to serve us and we are here to serve each other because serving each other is serving ourselves right and that's how we have to be sort of shifting that's the eco renaissance that's the rebirth that's what it's all about oh Marcy, that's so awesome. I just have loved this conversation so much. This has been uh, a blast. And I I love talking with people like you who kind of share the those similar passions that I do and and somebody who especially just has your your longevity and expertise uh, in this industry. It's been a wealth, just your wealth of knowledge. And it's been a pleasure. Um, So for the listeners, I'm going to have all of Marcy's information in the show notes, uh, you know, links to her brands, and obviously her book, please go buy this book. Um, I'm just going to just, you know, no shame, put it out there, go order it on, you know, <laughs> get it from your local indie bookstore. Uh, you know, I think it's what is <laughs> or it? Amazon. Or, book. Yeah, it's up everywhere. You know. see Amazon, Target.com, the Barnes yes. and Noble, but also yes, bookstores too. Yes, I'm all about I that was my like one uh, early on in the pandemic, I discovered I'd never even known that you could do this because I have so many friends who are authors. And I, I, have, I think it's indiebound.com. You can search the book that you are wanting to buy like you would on, you know, Amazon or or Target or Barnes and Noble, but then it'll connect you with a local bookstore that you can order it through. And all my, my local bookstore here uh, in the Durham area has like curbside pickup. And usually it's within, you know, a day or two. So it's no, you know, takes no longer than Amazon. I I like knowing that I'm supporting my little indie bookshop because I, you know, I'm a big reader. So anyway, that's my little shameless plug. Uh, But before we go, Marcy, this is the point of the show where I just get to ask some fun, get to know you questions. (laughs) Not that we haven't. Bring it on. You know, so yes, I love that attitude. Okay. So uh, question number one is what is your guilty pleasure? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you know, it's one of these things that probably is why I can endure the kind of days that I endure is I start every day with a steam and Mm. I love a good, like I'm a massage junkie. Mm. So every weekend I get body work and then, you know, on the food side, probably chocolate, Mm. like definitely if there, if you put a good dairy free vegan chocolate organic in front of me, like it's, there's no stopping me. Okay. I don't know if you've ever made this, but this was a recipe I made a couple years ago and you could probably just ser- search it, but it's um, a paleo chocolate pudding. It's dairy. I mean, it's dairy free paleo chocolate pudding, but it's made with, and people listening are going to be like, what? I'm about to change your life. Okay. <laughs> Basically it's like three ingredients. It's avocados, dates, and hundred mm. percent, no sugar added cacao powder. And I don't remember the exact ratio, but I'm sure you can find a recipe online and you basically just put it all in a food processor and it legit tastes like chocolate icing. Like it is like it. I'm like, there's no way that this is healthy, but it's literally like avocados, dates and cacao powder. Every time I make it. That's the beauty of nature, right? Because there is health benefit. And yet at the same time, I'm like, sign me up for that. Every time I make a batch, I eat, (laughs) I eat it all like in like one sitting. It's so good. I also just made these coconut date bars that Mm. I was saying to my husband, I was like, if I add a little chocolate into these, they would taste (laughs) like the Girl Scout cookies, like caramel delights. Mm -hmm. Like that's what it tastes like is. And he was like, yeah, you're right. We, now we need to figure out how to add chocolate to this recipe. Um, chocolate, every chocolate, everything, chocolate, everything. Give me all the chocolate. <laughs> Love it. Um, okay. So what is your favorite ethical fashion brand that you are not connected to? Mm-hmm. Probably, uh, but either Mara Hoffman Ooh. or Stella McCartney, which is a little out of reach on the day to day, but on this special occasion, I mean, her styles and her fits. I I really love, but on a more of a day to day, like, you know, I just went to India, actually spent the last month and I uh, celebrated the Pongal festival one day with all the farmers and was in this beautiful flowing Mayor Hoffman dress that I love. (sighs) Um, So yeah, probably. And, and I, and for underwear, like we are ha, because we have a great partnership with we are ha as well as a partnership, which is growing now with adore me. So um, both of those brands are, you know, in the family, um, on the lingerie side. And, and yeah, I so, love that. Lots more, lots, lots more. I, I also am a Stella McCartney fan. Uh, I don't own any of her things, but, uh, every year my husband and I go to, um, a conference for, uh, something connected to his work and there's always a black tie event and I've rented 
Stella McCartney dresses through Rent the Runway uh, quite a few times and yes. love there's some they've been some of my favorites. So big, big fan. Okay. I'm a huge rent the and I'm a huge rent the runway person. Yes. Like I will always have, you know, my my rent the runway selects in always every yes. month. I've been since they started. Yes. I'm a huge I'm so glad to hear that because I also just I love their stuff. Um, especially for kind of those occasions where I'm like, I don't need a I'm not gonna buy yeah, a dress. Right <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. Oh man, that's awesome. Okay. So I know that you're a big traveler uh, and you travel a lot for business. What is the best vacation you've ever taken? Oh my gosh. Best vacation. So probably, you know, look, I have a house in Costa Rica for a reason. Mm. Um, I am like a definite Costa Rica, like fan club, you know, person. So um, we go there quite a bit, but I would say kind of really unique vacation would either be, I'd say when I went with my kids to Bali and we stayed with, um, my friend John Hardy, and he has a green school and he has a whole green village that his daughter, you know, built all made of bamboo. And their house is like this five star bed and breakfast resort with like all beautiful, all organic, everything, right. And all natural woods and bamboos. And it's just stunning. And so, so, um, just like that whole design thing that I've been speaking to, which is like, so, inspiring. And yet at the same time, the reminder that everything's working with er the earth. And then the other, I think probably really eye-opening trip is I went to Cambodia with my Mm. husband and going to an organic silk farm was one really interesting, fascinating from the beginning, all hand dyed, all organic mulberry and the way the whole process worked. But then also going into this thing called the floating village, this area which just is a reminder of how simple people are living around the world, living on the water. But I think that reminder again of like, we don't need all the noise and the stuff. What we really need is to be in harmony with our environment and with each other. And that piece, as we start to integrate it into who we are, right? It's like, we weren't able to go outside during the pandemic, but we were able to go inside. And it's tapping into that reminder, which I think is what is driving this reset and this, you know, kind of everybody kind of waking up. And and so I think that we're in this really exciting time and travel is has always for me been, you know, a reminder of all the different pieces of who we are as a global one love, one humanity, one community, one planet. Mm, That's so good. I have always wanted to go to Bali. That's like a bucket list location. I, when I was a high school teacher, I chaperoned a field trip to Costa Rica and fell in love with it. So I can totally understand why you own a home there because it is beautiful and would love to go back someday. Magical, magical. Okay. And India, I will just, I got to give a plug. Yes. My half, my happy place that I go, we have an office, Eco Fashion Corp has an office in Mumbai. And I actually was just there. And I think Mm, I mentioned, I actually got COVID while I was there. (laughs) Um, But, you know, being in the farms, being in the factories, and especially so many of our partners are women and, you know, represent like this, you know, women's empowerment from the seed all the way up to the consumer, serving each other in this win-win model. That makes me so happy when I am like, I literally cry tears of joy when I'm dancing with the female farmers. And, and I, I just keep going back for more because it just, it, it really is something that is at the core of my life work. Oh, I love that per- perspective so much. Okay, then my last question is the question I ask all my guests. And that is Marcy, what does it mean to you to run a business with purpose? Hmm. I actually would never run a business that wasn't with purpose um, because to me, the power of business to transform the world in a positive way, you know, is government is just moves too slowly. Consumers need, you know, a place to, to be activated and business has this amazing opportunity to be a part of the change we all wish to see so that we can, as both, you know, consumers and you know, in business together, we can eat the change, live the change, drink the change and wear the change we all wish to see. And I feel, you know, as a parent as well, you know, it's like Native American wisdom. We don't inherit this land from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. As business leaders, 
it's our job to leave this earth as good, if not better than the way we found it for future generations and to protect, you know, farmer and worker welfare, as well as, you know, human and environmental wellness um, through business. So I think that that accountability has changed. And what for me has always been inherent to my business leadership, business with purpose, you know, never, ever an option other than that, I think is finally catching on. And and the more people that sort of, you know, drink the proverbial business with purpose Kool-Aid, the better the world that we'll all co-create. Oh, Marcy, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you for sharing your wisdom and expertise with us. Thank you so much for having me and have a wonderful week and journey from here. So much love. Friend, I would love to know what you loved about this episode or something that you learned. Find me on social media. I'm at Still Being Molly or at Business with Purpose Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. And don't forget to use that hashtag Business with Purpose Podcast when you're sharing the show with a friend. Thanks so much for listening to this week's episode. If you are a first time listener of the show, welcome. Be sure to check out the archives for past shows featuring so many incredible entrepreneurs, business owners, community leaders who are changing the world. If you are a regular listener of the show, thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for tuning in week in and week out. Be sure to head on over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Radio Public, Overcast, Stitcher, basically wherever you get your podcasts, click that subscribe or follow button. To click that button means you will never miss a new episode of the show. And while you're there, would you take a moment to just leave a review? Would you take a moment to maybe share one of your favorite episodes with a friend? Leaving a review, sharing the show with a friend. It is totally free for you and it is the biggest help for me in the entire world. You have no idea how much I appreciate it. It just also helps me to know what you're liking and how the show is impacting you. As always, this show is produced by the incredible team at Third Wheel Media. Thank you so much for listening. Now go do something good with purpose on purpose. <laughs>